fantastic. All right. Okay, hopefully all of you can see my my screen here. We're going to talk about this uh, this crazy complex style um, that has evolved over the years. And today, nobody's quite sure what the heck it is um, anymore, it seems like. So I'm going to try to break that down a little bit, try to figure out what a, a fest beer is, what a Meritzen is, what an Oktoberfest beer is, and how all these things evolved to get us to where we are today. Uh, before I do that, I'm going to pour myself a beer. Um, I've got my, my beautiful Willie Becker. It's, a, it's an Edelstoff uh, Willie Becker, which I'm going to mention in the presentation. I've got one of these these beautiful uh, brand spanking new uh, Hellas's from Vine Stefaner uh, in the uh, tall cans. These just came out a few months ago. Uh, they're super fresh, they're only a, a couple of months old. I've got a couple Oktoberfest and Fest beers, but I need to save those for presentations. So with that, and that beautiful, perfect pour right there, that's just how that beer would be served in Munich, right? Like that with about an inch and a half ahead. With that, I'll say Prost and get started. Ah, oh, that is so fresh. That is like being in a German beer garden right there. Okay. So a little about me to get us started. Uh, I'm sure most of you know about the BJCP uh, program. I'm one of the master level judges in that program. I think, uh, I think we're up to about 9,000 judges in, in this program right now. Uh, there's a huge international um, component to the BJCP these days. Almost, I would, gosh, I'd say three fourths of the new exams are international these days. So out of those 9,000 or so uh, uh, active judges, there's only about 125 at the master and grandmaster level. So I, I'm one of those uber geeks. Um, also took the certified Cicerone exam. I was one of the first certified Cicerones years ago when that program got started. It's a little more on the hospitality side, not quite as technical. Uh, but gets into a lot of, you know, other components of, of beer, beer service, um, beer and food pairing, draft systems, things like that. I've been teaching for, well, I've been teaching beer judge prep classes for, I guess, close to 20 years now. And uh, I teach at Indiana University, IUPUI, here in, <clears throat> here, <clears throat> pardon me, here in Indianapolis. Uh, I teach a uh, uh, world beer styles and sensory analysis course every semester. And I, once a, a year, I teach a seven day intensive course on craft brewery operations uh, for people who want to work in the industry. And then I've also got some, a three part evening class that I do for the general public on world beer styles and, and some history and sensory analysis type stuff through my uh, beer MBA website. Starting about 12 years ago, I think, I started uh, running these epic beer trips to Germany, Belgium, the Czech Republic. Obviously, that's been uh, uh, put on hold as we get through this pandemic, but I, I am still hoping, I was hoping to do one in the summertime. It's a little, little iffy uh, on the late July, August timeframe, which is when my summer trips usually go. Um, they're, they're having a slow rollout of the vaccine. So that may not happen again this year, but I have a Christmas markets <clears throat> and beer trip planned for early December that might go this year. So <clears throat> anyway, if not this year, we'll certainly do it uh, 
in the years to come. You can check those out on the website if you have any interest in, in this. They're, they're really incredible trips that um, get you behind the scenes and you know, situations and places and beer cellars that you would just never be able to, to do on your own. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, and the hotels and motor coaches and all that stuff's all taken care of. So you don't have to worry about all that kind of worry free, have fun, travel and see super cool stuff. Been home brewing uh, 30 plus years now, not as active uh, brewing these days as I used to be, but used to be very, very active, won uh, lots of awards, won a national uh, NHC gold medal, um, <clears throat> things like that. And I also um, am an international whiskey judge. So I, I judge uh, on the international whiskey competition panel each year. I've been doing that for six or seven years now. So I'm a big old beer and whiskey geek. So on to the topic. Was ist das Bier ein Bier? What is this beer? That's the big question, right? Is it dark or is it light? Is it malty? Is it dry? What do they serve at the Oktoberfest these days? How do you evaluate these beers? Sometimes they're, they're, they're broken out into separate categories, sometimes multiple different categories. Sometimes they're all grouped together. So how, how, do, you, how do you evaluate? Uh, a style like that. What should you make? And am I brewing to compete in, you know, local and national competitions? Or am I, am I just brewing something that I want to personally drink? Always a big question anyway. So we'll try to answer some of that. Here is uh, some, we'll start off with Paul Honor. Paul Honor's got a, a big history, obviously, with the Oktoberfest event as well as these styles of beer. Um, and as you'll see in the next screen here, they make both of them and they're both available uh, here locally in Indianapolis. They probably are where you are uh, at as well. Uh, I took one picture this past fall of both of cases of both of them sitting right next to each other. So, you know, it's not one style. It, it is most clearly two different styles these days. So we have the amber version here, which they call the Oktoberfest uh, Merzen. Uh, the amber version developed over 200 years ago to celebrate the original Oktoberfest. Uh, Merzen comes from March beer. I'll explain that more. Uh, full-bodied, rich flavor, and not we're, it's not full-bodied as we would talk about in BJCP terms, but in marketing terms, yes, uh, more of a medium body, actually. Um, but very flavorful beer. Obviously, when you see that kind of color, you can start to see what kind of malts are in there, and you know this is, this is going to have some of the darker Munich malts, and it's going to have that bready, bread crusty character and that sort of thing. Uh, ABV 5.8. IBUs about 21, okay? Then we have this type, uh, also says Oktoberfest, but this is Oktoberfest uh, Wiesen, Oktoberfest Wiesen. And this is the, uh, the golden version of the beer, 6%, so very similar to the other one, 19 IBUs, very similar to the other one. The big thing is is the color, and obviously at this point we're we're losing some of that bready, toasty, uh, darker Munich type malt and that sort of flavor, and uh, the spears, you know, presenting more like a big malty Hellas with a touch of um, touch of Munich in there. Okay. Side note, Wiesen. You saw that on the slide back here, Wiesen. The Wiesen stands for uh, Devizen, and that is the grounds where the Oktoberfest is held. So the locals, a lot of times, they don't call the event the Oktoberfest. They say are, they're going to Devizen or just Wiesen. Um, this is based on uh, Theresen Wiesen, which is Teresa's Meadow is the translation on that. Teresa was the bride of King Ludwig I, uh, not crazy King Ludwig who built the castle, that's a whole other story for another day, 
but this was uh, grandfather King Ludwig I, who married uh, Theresa Sachsen Hufelhausen. And for the party, they, they threw a bigger than normal uh, harvest festival as sort of a wedding reception, invited all the townspeople out and uh, turned into this giant party and everybody loved it and they had such a good time that they decided that they would do this every year and the Oktoberfest was born. So the Wiesen, when you see that, that's the grounds where it's held. It's, it's short uh, uh, slang name for the grounds where Oktoberfest is held. But you'll see that on some of the beers like Paul Honors. Uh, similar beer styles. So the modern Oktoberfest beers can be similar to all of these. The Municellus or the beer we call Fest beer. Um, it could be similar to a Hellas export beer, uh, like a Einger Jahrhundert. It could be similar to a Hellas Bach or my Bach. I differentiate those two. BJCP puts them together, but my Bach, uh, has a little different uh, history and tends to be more amber. So Hellesbach or Maybach, it could be similar to one of those. Uh, the actual beer that we call Merzen, it could be similar to a Vienna lager. It could be similar to a lot of Franconian beers and I'll get to that a little bit later. These are just sort of house beers that small breweries make in Franconia and Franconia is that sort of middle section of Germany, the upper uh, part of Bavaria, of the Bavarian state. And these modern interpretations can also be very similar to Czech amber lagers. Uh, the Czech amber lagers using Pils malt and Vienna, um, clean lager yeast. They can also prevent ver present very similar uh, to these. So depending on whether you're looking at the amber type or the golden type, all of these styles here, if you push a little bit of malt this way versus that way and ABV up or down just a little bit and just, you know, tiny little tweaks, you can end up with any of these beers. And why that is, is because we're working with the same tools. Um, you know, we're working with clean uh, clean German lager yeast. Uh, for the darker ones, we might be working with decoction uh, mashing, which I'll talk about uh, in a little bit. And then we're, we're working with the same basic malts, um, some Pils malt uh, as a base, some Vienna, light Munich, dark Munich. And again, tweaking, pushing, and pulling on these ingredients in one direction or the other and you can end up with all of those styles that I, that I just mentioned. So <clears throat> to start to unravel uh, this story, let's start where all stories, all good stories should start, which is the beginning. And in the beginning, uh, we probably were looking at the birthplace of loggers. This is different than what some of the books will tell you, but we're probably looking at Franconia. The rock cellars of Franconia is where uh, they were making cold fermented beers. They didn't specifically call them lagers at that time, but there are documents going back to the 1200s and the 1300s that talk about better beer coming from the cellars. Um, even uprisings between the people who made beer up top versus people who had rock cellars and saying that they had an unfair advantage. Um, there were, uh, in these documents from this era, 1200s and 1300s, there were people called Hefners that were yeast handlers that took care of preparation of yeast uh, for both bakers and brewers. So, you know, the, the old story that the Rhine Heitzgebo did not include yeast because we didn't know what it was yet, that's, that's BS. Um, we've known what yeast was and we had special, uh, almost a specialized industry handling yeast preparation. 
uh, going as far back as the 12 and 1300s. So they knew what it was. They just considered it part of the process, I believe, instead of an ingredient. Uh, also, and this is very surprising, uh, there were even discussions back in the 12 and 1300s about yellow beers. So golden beers, um, you know, we always hear this story that, oh, we didn't have pale malts and we didn't have golden beers until Pilsner Quell created the first one or some, you know, stuff like that. And that's just silly. I've got a whole other presentation on Pilsner and Quell and some of the first golden lagers and just not true. These, these beers probably date way, way back. Um, we do know that the English and probably um, Belgium both had pale malt by, by the early 1700s. So at least by the 1700s, some people were making golden colored beers. Uh, so I'll get to, to that just a little bit more. But this was probably the birthplace uh, Franconia, because they, they, this was the first use of the rock cellars. Uh, this picture here is actually at Pilsner or Quell, um, but there's similar looking rock cellars all over Franconia. Um, and they, they've been using those. And obviously the, the ambient temperature in those rock cellars is getting down into, you know, forties, fifties degrees. I mean, they're chilly. And um, they were obviously fermenting beer down there, so they didn't call them lagers. They didn't, you know, know how to differentiate that, they, but they were making cold fermented beers. So all of this we're, we're know, we know more of now, we know more about it now. So that was probably the birthplace. They probably started making dark uh, lagers, then amber lagers, then eventually pale lagers. Although not too much on the pale lagers, they kind of stopped when they got to the ambers, but we'll talk a little bit more about that. So let's go just a little bit further. So we were at the 12 to 1300s. In the 1400s, this uh, beautiful, smoky, incredible goodness, one of my favorite beers of all time, uh, Schlenkele in uh, Bomberg. It, this is truly drinking history in a glass. This is going back to the 1400s when uh, malt was dried over burning European beech wood and imparting that smoky flavor into the malt. And that, you know, got cleaner as coal and um, uh, eventually electricity and other cleaner forms of, of drying came about, but, you know, back to the 1400s, you had to dry the malt somehow after, after malting it, and you dried it over burning wood, and that imparted smoke. And that's why a lot of people, they get very confused by this, because their, their flagship beer, which is shown in the picture here, that's, that's a Meritzen. And it's like, whoa, that beer is really dark. I mean, you can't see through that beer. Um, it's it's very dark brown, deep copper, you know, and pushing towards black. So people look at that and they're like, oh well, how 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 can that be a Meritzen? That's like, well, it's a historic version. It's a it's from way way back, and they called it a Meritzen. Plus, it's a smoked Meritzen, and the smokiness is going to darken the color as well. But this is where this the story begins. We've got dark. Um, dark, smoky lagers called Meritzens being made as far back as the 14 and 1500s up in Franconia, okay? So why did they call it Meritzen? Meritzen is short for Meritzen beer, which literally translates to March beer. And what this was, as this goes back to the time when we were using cool ships. And uh, uh, I could talk forever about cool ships, but uh, in short, you know, it was like the picture here. This is at Zoom Urge in Dusseldorf. Uh, they're one of the few people that still uses uh, a cool ship for making regular beer. I mean, there's a lot of places like Cantillon that use cool ships for making lambics, of course. But for making regular, non-sour, non-funky beers, there's still a, there's only a handful of people left in the world who who do that. Zoom Erge 
making the uh, alt beer in Dusseldorf is, is one of those. So back when you were using cool ships to drop the temperature of your uh, wort, and you would do that by taking the boiling wort and put it in a big pan, increase the surface area tremendously, let the cool night air blow over the top of it, and that would drop your temp temperature so that by morning you come in and you know it's at pitching temperature. But obviously this is very risky um, because you've got contaminants, uh, bacteria, wild yeast, all kinds of stuff in the air, and uh, much more of that in the summer time, in the warm months. In the cold months, you actually don't have that much because a lot of that stuff goes dormant and falls out of the air. So in 1553, uh, there was a Bavarian brewing ordinance that was established because of this. They, they didn't want sour beer being made, bad beer being made. So they said, hey, you can only produce beer between St. Michael's Day, which is September 29th, and St. George's Day, which is April 23rd. And that was the brewing season. Remember, things are warmer now. Um, so the, this was the cold period uh, for the people making uh, lambics like Cantillon that I mentioned earlier, uh, using, still using cool ships. Their brewing season has shrunk dramatically um, because of you know things uh, things getting warmer. But back in these days, you had a longer cold season, and which basically ran from late September to late April. Okay, so and, and here's another picture of a cool ship that's still being used. These are the only two, I think, the only two um, that are still being used. Well, I'll take that back. They're the two I've seen personally. I think there's a few others, but not very many. This one is at Zoom, uh, pardon me. This one's at um, Uflecu in Prague. They make the uh, dark Czech lager there. Um, really cool uh, uh, building and structure and cool if they still use uh, this old technology. So, uh, so anyway. Getting back to the story, what they would do with that brewing season is when it came around to March, then they would make the stronger beer that could survive in wooden barrels um, lagering for six months. Uh, now, even though it was cold, you still didn't have perfect pristine sanitation conditions. So uh, you still had to be careful with beer. And so the, the, a, a stronger, higher strength beer would protect a little bit more, let it age a little bit longer than normal. So in March, they would produce this strong beer that they would then tuck away in the caves and let it lager all summer. Um, and then in April, the end of the brewing season, then they would go back and start working like crazy to make the regular beer that they would then drink over the summer, right? So by the time that that last bit of beer they've made in April is starting to dry up, you're getting into August, September, October, and that's when, oh yeah, remember that March beer that we made? Well, that one's been tucked away and lagering and now we're ready to drink that one as we get things fired back up for the next brewing season. And, oh, by the way, that timed out perfectly with the fall festivals. And everyone thinks of fall festivals as being the Oktoberfest, which, as I said before, that was really more of a wedding reception um, that sort of combined with the traditional fall festivals. But if you go around Germany, and not even just Germany, but all over Europe, fall festivals, um, harvest festivals are a very, very common thing. Every little town has uh, a fall festival. And it was basically in the old days, you were celebrating having worked hard all summer uh, farming and getting the crops harvested, knowing you're not going to die this winter 
was worth celebrating, right? So there, you always had a lot of harvest time celebrations. And then, you know, right as you're harvesting all the crops up for the year, you've also got the strong beer that you tucked away back in March that is, is now going to come out. And so the two sort of became synonymous because of the timing and the, and the festival. So Marzen or Merzen was more of a concept, not a style. It was a concept of making a strong beer that you could tuck away for uh, lagering for six months. And, um, you know, they were, they had some similarities, of course, because of the same malts and yeast and location and, and that sort of thing. So there was obviously some similarities, but every brewery was making their own version of this strong beer that was becoming known as Merzen beer, right? So more of a concept than, than a style back in those early days. So then today, fast forwarding, in Franconia, that upper part of Bavaria, now you see, you still to this day see the house beer. Often it doesn't even have a name. Um, it's just beer, uh, or it's got a, uh, it doesn't have a style name, but it has, you know, a name of the brewery or a name of the brewer or the name of the city or, you know, it's got a name name, but it doesn't have a style classified with it. But guess what? They're what we would call Mertzens. Um, and they're, they're basically the house beer of all these little breweries all over Franconia. Uh, Kloster Weltenberg is kind of a, a famous one. Uh, it's just their house beer. It's the standard beer you drink when you go to Kloster Weltenberg. It's called Anno 1050. And um, there's this uh, absolutely amazing Keller beer festival in Forkheim, Germany, uh, just south of, of Bamberg, that I take my uh, groups to in the summer trips. It, this, this festival is amazing. It's on a, a Kellerwald, which is the hill where all of the breweries have their beer cellars. And this one time of year, late July, they, <clears throat> they serve their beer directly out of the beer cellar. And this, this festival goes back 200 years. And guess what we're drinking there? We're drinking Keller Merzens at that festival because it's just the house beer. So this amber lager uh, that we know of as Merzen and later became known as Oktoberfest uh, is a very common uh, style of beer in Franconia. So fast forwarding just a little bit more, Spaten was the first one to really start using these, these names that we know of today. In 1841, Spaten was the first um, brewery to bring a beer to Oktoberfest that they officially called Merzen beer, right? Um, interestingly enough, and of course these guys were, were friends, uh, Dreher in Austria created a similar beer uh, that same year, which he called a, a Vienna Lager, right? We know these styles. Or remember I mentioned Vienna Lagers. A lot of times people don't think of Vienna Lagers uh, as being uh, Meritzens, but they have way more similarities than, than you might an initially think. Little tweaking of the malt and uh, you have very similar beers. So then in 1872, uh, Spaten was also the first person to name their beer Oktoberfest beer. So this, this is where we're, for, so first we've made the official switch of using this amber lager from Franconia um, that originated in Franconia. They start making it around Munich. And then in 1841, they take it to the festival and they call it Merz and Beer. And then in 1872, they changed that to Oktoberfest beer, right? So now all these things are starting to, to intertwine. Little side note, as we talk about these dates, 1841, 1841, 
It's called Meritzen beer. They introduced this amber lager to Oktoberfest and Dreyer is introducing his amber lager, the Vienna lager uh, to Austria. That's 1841. What else is happening in the world around that time? 1842, Pilsner Quell, the first golden Pilsner style beer is introduced to the world. Now, they get a lot of credit for being the first Pilsner. And, you know, it's named after the town of Pilsen that it was created in and all that. But, you know, there were other people, smaller breweries. We know they had pale malt. We know they're making lagers. Um, and Pilsner Quell went and got, you know, a Bavarian brewer from a small little unknown brewery. And I'm sure there was a reason why they got Joseph Grohl to come make the beer. He probably had experience making golden lagers. So anyway, in Germany, they're just now introducing the amber lager. In Germany and Austria, they're just now introducing the amber lager. When in the Czech Republic, they're, they're introducing the golden lager. So prior to this, um, Germany, very stuck in tradition, was probably drinking more Dunkel style beers, more dark lagers. So this was kind of a big thing to introduce an amber lager around this time, but they were way behind because others were already producing golden lagers. And in Pilsner or Quell, they're, they're already producing, you know, this uh, uh, first Pilsner style beer. So the big Munich, Munich breweries, they had the capability to do this, but their traditions were kind of holding them back. Uh, there were small area, uh, small Munich area breweries making golden lagers at this time. This made those uh, big breweries in Munich very angry. Uh, there's some quotes from like the, um, the head of Augustiner in, in Munich that, that, that was very upset with these small breweries for making golden lagers and saying that they were just advertising for Pilsner. They were advertising for this golden beer from the other country, right? How dare them do this? So it took a while for them to break out of this mold and, and lagging behind the industry 30, 40, 50 years. Um, but finally, look at the date, finally Spaten in 1895 broke ranks and started making a golden lager. They could have done that a good 50 or 60 per, perhaps years before then. Uh, and oh, by the way, German brewers here in the U.S. were making golden lagers in the, in the 1850s. So there's some really interesting uh, history here about what was kind of holding, holding things back and why they were sticking with their, their amber lagers as the world was moving to golden. But then things changed again. Uh, it took a long time, but in 1953, Augustiner uh, brought their premium Hellas called Edelstoff to the Oktoberfest for the first time. Speaking of that, I'm gonna have a drink of beer, prost. Mm. So after Edelstoff gets introduced in 1953, the, the fans just went crazy for it, right? The attendees, this was by far, from what I've read, it was the most popular style of, of that year. Everybody loved it. And it still took some time for the other breweries to come out of their, you know, being stuck mode. But slowly in the coming years, uh, everyone started introducing uh, a, a big golden lager to the Oktoberfest event. So by the 1970s, to the 1990s, somewhere in that time frame, uh, golden lager was the only type uh, there. Now, <clears throat> this story is is interesting because there's some very notable 
um, German beer experts who say that Paul Lauder first introduced the golden beer in the 1970s. And um, I actually found uh, some research, some information coming directly from Paul Honor. And Paul Honor saying that Augustiner did it in 1953. So I, I tend to believe that. Um, first off, it's way past the time when it should have been introduced for 100 years, literally 100 years into golden lagers. Um, at this point. So it was well past time for those to be introduced. And why would Paul Honor in their own information say that Augustiner, a competitor, did it um, and not take credit for the, it themselves unless it was true? So um, <clears throat> it's this is not perfect. Um, none of us know for sure. But from what I've been able to find and piece together, this, this is the story that makes the most sense to me. So today, um, as of the 1990 standard, um, the original gravity, and this is translated from Plato, and it's, it's, es it's you know, roughed and estimated, but it's basically, uh, in 1990, they said, okay, we're going to make uh, the the beer served at Oktoberfest needs to be an original gravity of 1055 to 1058, needs to be about a 6% uh, ABV beer, and it needs to be golden in color. The only people who could use the term Oktoberfest beer legally are those uh, six breweries from the Munich area, Augustiner, Hockershore, Hofbräuhaus, House, uh, or Hofbräuhaus, House, uh, Leuvenbräu, Paul Honor, and Spaten. They're the only ones that can officially say that. Others must say something else. And I love, love, love what's on the, uh, the Eyinger uh, label. Look at that, right? They can't say Oktoberfest beer. You can't say Oktoberfest beer. So look what they said. October different word, fest dash Merzen, October fest Merzen. Okay, uh, that's kind of Eyinger's style. Uh, Eyinger, because they are just outside of Munich, they have never been invited uh, to join in the uh, October fest. Uh, so they have, have always been a little bit of an outlier and they always seem to kind of stick it to the Munich breweries. They, they tend to make their beers, everything's just a little bigger, a little more flavorful, uh, a little nicer. They're still a family owned brewery where everybody else is, has been you know, bought up by um, big conglomerates. I think with the exception of Augustiner, uh, which is still uh, uh, independent. But anyway, that's uh, kind of interesting on, on who can use the official name Oktoberfest beer. And then lastly, just kind of a side note, Paul Honor, uh, they don't even make their amber style for Germany anymore. They, they make it, I showed it, we talked about it earlier in the presentation, but that is only for export. They don't make that at all for uh, the German market, which is interesting. So here's some real simple uh, descriptors. When you say, well, well, what's what, right? There's these two different styles that kind of clearly uh, diverged in their path. And you're either gonna make the old style Merzen, which um, is the old school Oktoberfest, as well as the house beer of many breweries in Franconia. You're either going to make that or you're going to make a new fangled fest beer. And if you're going to make a Meritzen, and, and don't kill me for this descriptor, but it, it makes sense when you think about it. It's like a small, less malty, drier amber Doppelbach. Um, Doppelbachs 
often being decoction mashed, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, they do come in different colors. You have Hellas or pale versions. You've got really dark versions like Optimator. Um, but Salvatore, ones like that, the amber colored Doppelbox, if you made that, you know, 2% smaller, uh, less malt focused and just a little drier in the finish, eh, it's pretty much, you know, a, a good descriptor of a Merzen. For a Fest beer, uh, you're kind of using a Munich Hellas as a base and you're, you're making a little stronger, a little maltier uh, version of a Munich Hellas. And that would kind of be the general descriptor of, of a Fest beer. For more exacting descriptions, obviously you can go to BJCP. For one example, you can go to GABF uh, style guidelines. You can go to World Beer Cup style guidelines. Uh, all depends on, on you know, what you're making and who you're making it for. But there you're gonna get all the parameters. But this is in general, this is kind of what you're shooting for. If you think of Doppelbach and Munichellis as two styles a lot of people are very familiar with. And then you use this, this, these changes to those popular styles. That's going to lead you to these um, general uh, areas of Emeritus and, and uh, Festbeer. Some brewing tips on these. Uh, first off, to talk about specific details of, of malt percentages and exact malts to use. Um, it's, that's, that's a discussion that just goes in circles and would last forever because there's a million ways to do it. There's, there's a million recipes out there, uh, pick a, an award winning one and maybe start with that. Um, because there's, there's truly just a million different ways to tweak on the recipes. So that, that part is not something you know, we should necessarily be discussing here, um, but some general things that I can talk about in making these beer styles is first off, they're lagers. Um, you have to know how to make lagers and you have to know how to keep these beers clean. Um, they're, they're subtle, nuanced uh, styles in, in the perfection of them. So a seed aldehyde, um, you know, common lagering issues, acetaldehyde and diacetyl need to be um, eliminated. Um, autolysis, other, you know, issues people get into with uh, long fermentations, uh, long maturation. Autolysis is something you want to stay away from. Um, warmer temps and esters, you definitely have to stay away from. There are, there is some fruitiness that you get from Munich malt as soon as that alcohol content starts to, to bump up there towards 6% uh, and above. Anytime you're using Munich malt, you start to get this kind of um, um, purple grape-like fruitiness, but that's malt derived and should not be confused with an ester. So ester fruitiness is different. Um, if you get this malt derived purple grape type uh, fruitiness, that's okay. That's, that's malt derived. So you have to know the difference between um, those different types of fruitiness and you have to keep these beers clean and just super well-made lagers. So no acetaldehyde, no diacetyl, no autolysis, um, no, no off characteristics from, from long maturation. Uh, second thing you really have to watch on this style is they have to be well attenuated. Uh, uh, so many times I'm judging these beers and people have, they either just didn't um, get the attenuation that they want wanted, or they have mistaken maltiness for sweetness. And maltiness and sweetness are two completely different things. Sweetness is how a beer finishes and it's it's a residual uh, sugary character, sweetness. Maltiness is a descriptive flavor. 
So, you know, Doppelbox, a good Doppelbox is going to be very multi, but it's not going to be sweet. Okay, multi and sweetness. Don't don't confuse those two. Um, so well attenuated. And then lastly, they are not necessarily if you can make uh, if you can make good clean loggers, right? First off, that's a challenge. But if you can make good clean loggers, then they're not necessarily a hard. They're not hard styles to make, but they're very hard styles to perfect. They're subtle, they're nuanced. That little pushing of the malt one way or the other pushes it into a different style slightly or pushes it into a slightly different flavor category. That's the hard part to nail. And then as a home brewer or small batch brewer, trying to be consistent once you do nail it, is is perhaps even harder so uh those are are some of the overall um keys i think to brewing those for the meritsons um also to consider decoction mashing i don't know how uh advanced uh some of you are i'll talk just a little bit about decoction mashing um most brewers today do a single step mash uh, hold it at the uh, sacrification rest and convert starches to sugars. Uh, decoction mashing is a complex, more complex multi-step mash where you're going through an acid rest, a protein rest, and then the sac rest. And in the old days, you know, this was how they, they used decoction because they didn't have thermometers and they didn't have a way to um, to know what temperature they were at. So this was a way to hit uh, those different temperatures that we now know what they are. But at one time it was start at a certain point, uh, start at a certain uh, temperature, which I'll get to in just a second. And then from there, it was just time and volume. And what you see in this uh, chart, I think this shows it very well, what a decoction is, if you start here, uh, you know, around 100 degrees at an acid rest, pull about a third of your mash out, take it to a boil. That's what this is up here. So that's what the dotted line is. Um, mix that back in and mixing that, uh, you know, hotter uh, temp portion back into the main mash. That's obviously going to take you up to a, a higher temperature. Mix that all together pull that out again, another, pull out another third, take that to a boil, mix that back in. It's going to take you up to another temperature. We know that as the sacrification rest now. Do it another time, pull that third out, take it to a boil, mix it back in. It's going to take you to your mash out temperature. Okay. So at one time, um, we were doing that just to hit the temperatures and it was part of the process. It was not necessarily to pull out certain flavors. It was just to get efficiency out of your grain and it was how beer was made. Um, this is just kind of an interesting side note. How did we, without thermometers, how did they do this? Uh, there's three universal temperatures uh, in the world. That is one of them is when a liquid turns to a gas and that's boiling. One is when a liquid turns to a solid, which is freezing. And what is that third universal temperature? Everyone likes to say room temperature, but room temperature obviously varies whether it's cold or warm outside and that sort of thing. So the only other universal temperature that we have in the world is the temperature of us, body temperature. Um, we are um, 98.6, right? Round that up about 100 degrees. And we live in a very narrow range of temperature. If we get a little bit hotter or a little bit colder than 100 degrees, we're dying, right? So this is a very stable universal temperature. And you can even try this sometime 
uh, they, they called this a rule of thumb. Just about every industry had a rule of thumb. And one of the rules of thumb uh, in the brewing industry was stick your thumb in the mash and see if it was the temperature of you. Uh, and you say, oh, Ron, you can't do that. That's silly. It's actually not. If you take, if you take this beer um, or a glass of water or anything and you stick your thumb in it, it's amazing how you can tell instantly whether it's a little colder or a little warmer than you. So when you stick your thumb in there and you feel nothing, it's like, oh, that's the exact temperature of me. That's pretty much where the process started. Um, and uh, odd, you know, we, we go back to it now and you look at it, it's like, yeah, I'll be darned. That's where it starts. So um, that was just how it was done. So then it was done to hit your proper temperatures. But today, decoction mashing has really a completely different use. And that's to create these really complex uh, sugars and the keyword melanoidin flavors. A melanoidin flavor, one of the most simple basic things to think about is toast. Toast is a, a uh, Maillard reaction, which is a browning reaction. And the result of a Maillard reaction is this complex caramelized um, flavor. So when you um, toast bread, what it's doing is it's taking the sugars in the bread and running those through a Maillard reaction, <clears throat> that browning reaction, and creating uh, this richer, uh, more caramelized, in this case, toasty uh, sort of flavor. So that's a very uh, simple explanation of what a, a melanoidin is. But imagine, imagine going through this decoction, when you're pulling out, even though we're in the acid rest, you still have sugars being developed back here, right? There's sugars being developed all through here and they're all in all different developmental stages. So if I pull uh, some of those sugars out and take them to a boil and, and start you know, running them through a browning uh, reaction there, uh, I'm, I'm changing their flavor. And then I mix them back in, I pull another third out. Well, this time I'm pulling out sugars at a different stage of formation. I'm pulling out some sugars that haven't been pulled out before. I'm pulling out some sugars that were already pulled out in the first decoction. Then I'm mixing those back in. Then I'm pulling those out again and taking them back through another, another uh, Maillard reaction. And now this time I've got sugars being pulled out uh, uh, at a different stage of formation. Some have been through two decoctions. Some are coming out for the first time. Some have been through one decoction. So you can just see what you're doing here. You're just pulling these sugars in all different stages uh, of formation and, and running them through this, this Maillard reaction. I, I don't want to say uh, caramelization. Um, we, we say that a lot in brewing, but I try to avoid it these days because we went through discussions a while back and you know, the BJCB guidelines were changed to try to get rid of the term caramelization because it's technically inaccurate. Um, caramelization is like a candy making term. And in order to caramelize something, you have to eliminate all the water. So when you eliminate all the water, then you can actually raise the temperature higher than 212. So like caramelizing an onion, you start cooking on it. Once all the water's cooked out of it, well, now that temperature can go up to 350 degrees. That's caramelization. We're still dealing with a liquid that can't go above 212. So caramelization is technically the wrong term. So we, we need to talk about it more in Maillard reactions and browning reactions, not caramelization, even though I know we, we continue to use them in brewing. Just know the, just know the difference. So anyway, we use this, uh, this uh, decoction technique. Uh, you've, got, you've got a variety of Vienna malt, um, light Munich, dark Munich, um, and, and then running all of that complexity through this whole other level of complexity of decoction mashing. 
And that's how we're creating this, this intangible, unbelievable, uh, multi-deliciousness that we find in the Doppelbox and the, and the Merits and Beers uh, specifically. Okay. Um, so some final thoughts on this, and then we'll get to some questions. Um, trying to nail the style and get it perfect is half the fun. Um, and if you don't nail the style, it's highly likely, as long as you made a good, clean lager, it's very likely that you probably nailed one of those other styles. Remember I mentioned all those different sort of similar styles. Um, if you don't nail one, you probably maybe made one of the other ones. So enjoy the journey and, uh, you know, just trying to make that perfect German lager with the perfect maltiness is, uh, is just sort of all, all part of it. Uh, I definitely, I didn't mention melanoid malt. Obviously, a lot of people use just a, a little melanoidin malt to sort of uh, simulate that complex decoction mashing. And you can do that. I mean, there's some very, very good beers uh, made with uh, a little melanoidin malt. You can also get tricky and even use a little bit of special B uh, to kind of generate some of that dark fruit uh, character. So there's some really good beers made without decoction mashing. Uh, so it's also just sort of a level of geekiness and what you want to do. I also didn't get into some of the things that, that I know Chuck uh, and I see all the time and, and chat about in making great German lagers, uh, which is, uh, you know, spunding and, um, um, oh shoot, um, I lost the name. What's, what's, Chuck, what's the, uh, I can't believe I forget the name of this. Um, With the, the uh, acid, the sour goo? Yes, yeah, sour, sour goo, sorry. Uh, you know, a lot of folks are going to talk about it can't be an authentic, wonderful German lager without using sour goo and, um, and uh, spunding, which is, you know, collecting the, the natural carbonation and low dough, uh, whole low oxygen brewing. And while I know all of those things improve a beer, um, you can still make really wonderful styles without doing any of that. And it's been done and has been done for hundreds of years. Um, so to me, uh, those are wonderful things to do. Uh, a lot of us are in this hobby because we like the equipment and the gadgets and the whole technical geeky aspect of it. And, uh, you know, using sour goot, making your own sour goot and, and uh, you know, adjusting your pH with that and spunding and uh, the, extra steps to to do low oxygen brewing and all of that stuff is you know it's it's what a lot of people want to do um but you don't have to do that uh, against what some people may think you don't have to do that to make a great german lager um and there's as i said there's evidence all over germany of small breweries that make very wonderful beers and really don't even do any of that themselves so um, anyway, uh, a little bit about me, uh, staying in touch with me, please do. Um, my website, beerandba.com, you can see all about my trips and stuff there. Uh, on Facebook, I am pretty maxed out on friends. Uh, might have room for, for a few folks, but I've, I've got 5,000 and Facebook won't let you have any more. So I got to delete some every time I, um, every time I add some, I have to delete some. So um, Twitter and Instagram, I don't use either one of them very much, but I, I'm trying to get better at those. And then my uh, YouTube channel, please. Uh, I've got some good stuff on there right now. I had to finish up my uh, brewery operations course online, uh, the last two classes. So I've got a bunch of really great technical information. I'm not sure I'm going to keep it on there, but it's on there for now. 
Um, but I'm adding, you know, more videos like this and things. Um, so uh, subscribe to that. That helps me get seen uh, more and helps me spread the, I'm not trying to be a YouTuber and make money or anything, but I do enjoy education. I've been doing that for a long time. And if I can uh, spread some knowledge out there and let people enjoy this hobby or learn something that uh, that's what I appreciate. So my, my YouTube channel, and I'll send out a link uh, about this later. And uh, other than that, just thanks so much for having me and uh, uh, letting me yammer about beer for a while. So thank you. I'm going to stop the share and uh, I will open this up. Let's, uh, I'm still recording. So let's uh, keep it tame for a little bit and see if there's any questions I can help with. Well, just first off, thank you very much for sharing kind of your knowledge and experience in the space. Um, you know, a lot of history and background and, um, you know, super interesting, uh, particularly for me having a German heritage. And like I had grandparents who came to this country and brewed German and Austrian beer styles at home in the basement and yep. went up the street to the brewery with a little pot to get some yeast to bring home to, to pour in the barrel and stuff like that. So, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I didn't mention that, but you're in Ohio. Um, I'm in Indiana, all over the Midwest. We were pretty much founded by Germans. Um, in the 1800s, we, we grew substantially here in Indiana and almost everybody that came uh, during that time period were Germans. So about 90%, it's been estimated 90% of the population, uh, the original population of Indiana were German. And I, I would guess Ohio is uh, just about the same, if not even maybe higher. So yeah. uh, we, were, we were pretty much founded by Germans. And, and if you look in, into our heritage around here, that's, that's where all the German brewing and beer culture is. Well, cool. What uh, what questions do folks have? Well, tell me, tell me where. Yeah, Corey. So, uh, just out of curiosity, I am uh, I do all grain. Uh, I do not have fermentation temperature control, so I'm just doing ale. Do you know if anybody has had success? replicating or coming up with these styles using like some of the newer quake yeast, some of the ones that tend to be pretty clean fermenting without yeah. having to do they're, they're, they're lager. Not gonna, yeah, uh, Quebec yeast, stay away from that if you want to make a clean lager, I would say. I know there's a lot of people experimenting with it and they're, you know, they're pretty happy with their results, but I have not tasted one that tasted like an authentic lager. Maybe there's some out there, but I have not tasted one yet. I it still tastes it's got an oddness to it that just isn't the same. It's hard to fake a good German lager. Um, you can if you don't have temperature control. Uh, you can certainly aim for the amber type and use like a German ale yeast at a cooler temperature. Um, you know, just put it in your basement or uh, someplace where it's a little cooler than room temperature, maybe, and 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 just ferment with a German ale yeast or something. And uh, that would be, I guess, you know, a pseudo lager. You're you're going to pick up some est <clears throat> you're going to pick up some esters, but 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 you know that like 107, I I think it is. I used to use that one a lot. If you keep the temperature really cool, the ester profile is really, really low. And if it's got some uh, darker Munich in there as well, uh, it's going to mask some of that imperfection of being a perfect lager. So you can make a pretty good pseudo lager if you just kind of do it on the cool side of ale fermentation. That's, that's a possibility, certainly. I wouldn't go for the fest beer. The fest beer needs to be a full-blown clean lager. It's just going to be too evident in that style. But anyone else? Anyone doing Lodo and some of that uh, high tech stuff I mentioned? Yeah, Chuck a little bit, Eric a little bit, or full. It's cool stuff. Um, 
I've got a lot of friends over here, uh, full, full on Lodo. And I've seen some really cool experiments with it. Um, it there, there's definitely a, um, a change and it's an improvement. I think also though, people, when they move to, to Lodo and start doing some of these other things like using sour goot and, uh, and spunding, by the time you get to that point where you can do that, you've upgraded your processes and equipment to the point where you're just naturally also going to make better beer. Um, so some of it I, is just sort of a, a natural outgrowth of moving in that direction, right? But it's, uh, it's good stuff. Yes, Jeff W. I can't hear you. There, I can hear you, I think, now. No, I still can't. Nope. You're not muted. Your mic must not work. Yeah, we can't hear you, Jeff. You have a defective, you work on your, you work on your mic, David Ward. Question on decoction. When you pull that one third out, are you looking to get just liquid? Or are you looking to get some grain with it? What's the <laughs> David? Formula? That is a wonderful question. Um, I I have seen people do both. Um, you can you can pull out the whole uh, thick slurry uh, or parts of it, um, and and do that. And, and boil that, obviously stirring uh, constantly because you've got the heavier stuff that's going to sink to the bottom. So you've got a scorch, uh, you got a bigger scorch risk when you do that. Um, plus, I think there's, uh, you, can, you can maybe be pulling some uh, tannins and polyphenols, perhaps a little bit more from the husk when you do that. Um, but... I, I've seen and heard of it being being done both ways. If you're interested in doing that, I'd, I'm not an expert on decoction. I've done it a few times many years ago. Um, I'd, I'd look into it a little deeper and maybe ask on the German brewing site. That's a great wealth of, of knowledge on there. You could ask a question like that and get a lot of experienced feedback on it. Yeah, I can. It's a great question, though. It's a great question. Yeah, I, I can. So personally, I've done both. Um, sometimes <laughs> I'll pull a thick decoction for jumping from like, I don't know, like a 145 to like a 162. Mm -hmm. But then I'll do like a thin where it's just almost strictly wort to take it to the mash out. Just as a simple way to kind of do that. Um, I got a separate little induction cooktop for fooling around with that. Just it's, it was kind of, it was, it's tricky if you've got a burner. I tried to do it once or twice on a burner and that was kind of, your, your burner better have really good control or else you're definitely going to scorch something. You have to really stay on top of it. Um, the induction cooktop is kind of slick that way in that you'll never, you'll never scorch something in those. I mean, you have to really try hard, I think, to, to scorch something in them. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's see, I wanted to check and see if Jeff someone, was someone there. asked about that smoked beer mentioned earlier. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, there, there's some great recipes out there. The one thing I say about smoked beers is go big or stay home. Uh, <laughs> too, too many people want to put like 15% smoked malt. Well, no, hundred percent go for it. Uh, if you want to make a good, awesome smoky beer, you're going to use uh, almost entire, uh, entirely smoked malt. And even, even doing that, if you're buying, it's better today than it used to be. Um, but uh, if the malt gets old, it loses some of its smokiness. So you want to make sure you have really good, fresh smoked malt and then use a very high percentage of it. If you don't and use a low percentage, um, some people like it that way, but I'm not a fan. To me, it, it, it 
pulls out more of the medicinal components. It's too apt to do that. You know, uh, medicinal chloroseptic like phenol and smoke phenol are very close to each other. And uh, it can very easily sort of slip to one or the other. It's that slippery slope of phenols. I have a whole presentation on that. Um, so go big, go big and keep your, make sure your water is dechlorinated very well and um, don't let any chlorinated water come into contact with your smoky wort or beer because that um, chlorophenol will mix with the smoke phenol and it will taste like chloroseptic. I guess that just a fancy way of saying shit. <laughs> no, no, no. Chloroseptic is uh, uh, the, the throat spray. Oh, okay. All right. Um, like, or, or uh, really to be like septic, like septic system. I was no, like, no, that's no, no, no. pretty Chlor bad. Travis. Chloroseptic, a common throat spray. Uh, also, it's the same, <laughs> same flavor you get out of a really uh, peaty scotch like Laphroaig. Okay. Uh, Laphroaig, Ardbeg, they have a very chloroseptic y. Yeah, not like septic tank. Uh, yeah, that's what I thought you were. I was like, man, that's, I'm yeah, not, that's, I just did, a, I, I'm not, I'm freaking smoke out smoke. now. I just did a smoke no, like that. <laughs> That's called enteric. <laughs> uh, that's the fancy way of saying shit. <laughs> I was like, enteric. You don't want enteric either. <laughs> Sorry. I'm that guy in the club. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> okay, guys, any other questions? So I, I just have one question real quick. Yeah. So you're saying to pull off like something like a really good Mars and you have to have the, the most important thing is controlled fermentation down. Certainly one of the most okay. important things. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, it's hard to, I, uh, like I said, you can do a, you can do uh, the maltier amber colored uh, Meritzen. You can certainly do that a little easier and make a, a close uh, approximation of a, of a lager with that. Um, mm -hmm. But to, to pull off a fest beer, uh, you're definitely gonna need to make a really good German lager. Okay. Proper. Yeah, that's. I think that's where I'm messing up. I'm trying to fake it, and it's just not, not happening. It it it's, it can be a subtle thing uh, to some people, um, but to others, it's very glaring. And it uh, just doesn't have that lager bite. It has. It's just too sweet. And it's not even like you were saying a multi sweet. It's just too sweet. It's just not. It's not finishing where I need it to or anything. I mean, it's just as soon as it looks great, but as soon as I taste, I'm like, nope. Uh, nope. Too sweet. Too sweet would, you know, under attenuated, uh, is what I would be concerned with there, and that's more of you know pitching, volumes and uh, health and vitality of yeast. And, uh, you know, th things like that is, and making sure the right, uh, the right sugars are there to be fermented, of course. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so if you're all grain and you're mashing, uh, make sure you're not mashing too high. Because you get up 155 and a little higher than that. And you're making, uh, you're making a lot of unfermentable sugars that just aren't going to go away. So, and, and you know, I've seen this. So what, what would you, you mean? What, what mash temperature do you like to see on something like you, that? You have to make sure, uh, before I get to that, also make sure that your thermometer is calibrated. Um, as a club, we've gotten together multiple times, haven't done it lately, um, but we've gotten together with a, a lab calibrated thermometer. And it's like, everyone bring your thermometer to see how close you are. And shit, there's thermometers out there that are five degrees off. So what... if you're having an, like if someone's having an ongoing problem with their beer, it's like everything's not attenuating, everything's too sweet. And they say, well, I'm, I'm not mashing too high. Maybe you are and you don't even know it because yeah. your thermometer's not, not uh, calibrated properly. So everything's five degrees higher than what you think it is, you know? So you think you're, you're mashing at 152 and you're mashing at 157, big difference, big difference. So where would you mash on these? Uh, depends on the on the recipe, but 
um, uh, probably uh, a, a bit lower than 155, probably maybe 152 ish or something like that. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Now, are most of these beers, do you do a diacetyl rest? Um, you know, that's up to, it's, it's, let's say this, it's always a consideration when you're making lagers because the, the potential is there for your yeast to start to go dormant on you and not finish its job of, of reabsorbing the diacetyl that got produced, right? That, that capability is always there. But if you know your system, trust your system, and trust your yeast, um, there's a lot of people that don't do diacetyl rests, and they're just fine. I know, I know of uh, more than one very good, well-known German lager producer in, in the U.S. that don't do diacetyl rest. They don't need to. Okay. So it's always a concern and you should always think about it, but it's not something you absolutely have to do um, to, to get them right. I, I, I don't need to on, on mine. I don't make that many loggers, but when I do, I just control the temperature and let it go and let it finish. And it's always fine. So it uh, sounds like you don't make uh, Martin all that often. I'm kind of curious, do you have like a personal preference on kind of what your, the grains that you use or the color that you kind of shoot for? I don't, unfortunately. I have made one for a couple of years. So I, I spend too much time teaching these days. <laughs> and there's so much great available beer too. I mean, even just like this beer right here, we're getting these beers in from Germany. And they're so fresh now. Oh, they, they used to be a year old and oxidized to, to beat the band. And now we're getting these things over and they're two months old and they still have fresh sulfur notes on them and stuff. So, um, so, I, so, I, so I don't have to, you know, back a long time ago, we used to have to make our own beer to, to get good beer. Uh, today, it's more of, of doing it because you want to. And uh I spend most of my want to time teaching these days. So no, I don't, I don't have any uh, like recipe off the top of my head to, to give you. So what's your go-to Mars? And if you're going to buy one, what's your, one of your go-tos to drink? Uh, Einger, if I can get it fresh is uh, probably my favorite out there. Um, it usually comes in pretty fresh. The, the biggest problem we have with um, Oktoberfest in general, and the, the, I'm going to let you in on my little uh, Ron Smith tip on buying imported beer. All the Oktoberfests shipped in the summertime to get here for the fall, which means you took these delicate, nuanced, wonderful German lagers and you shipped them in the hottest part of the year. And what happens during shipping is um, very few beers. Pilsner and Quell, they say they keep it cold the whole time. Maybe they do. It arrives here pretty fresh and quickly. But most beers are not kept refrigerated the entire time. So from the moment it leaves the brewery, it may go into a truck that's not refrigerated. And as soon as you get into a metal box in the summertime, you know how hot it's going to get inside that box. It's going to, it's going to hit 120 degrees inside that box on a hot summer day. So it goes from that box to a warehouse, which may not be refrigerated. And then it's going to sit in there for a little while. Then it's going to go into a cargo container, another metal box, and then it's going to go into the hole of a ship. And then it's going to, have a couple week voyage or whatever and it's going to sit in another warehouse and it's going to sit in another warehouse in your local city and all of that is happening in the heat of the summer so unfortunately that beer that arrives here in the fall whether it's Mertzen's or this Hellas or what have you I try to avoid that the best I can now the Mertzen's I have to buy them because I want to try them every year 
but they've suffered because of transport time um, of year. Best time to buy any German lagers uh, that are fresh. Uh, I mean, you could still run out there and buy a um, Einger Merzen today, but that shipped last year because they only make it seasonally. But like this beer, this we just got this, right? Which means it shipped over the winter time. So not only is it only a couple months old, but it shipped in the winter time when everything was cold. When mm -hmm. it was in that box truck, when it was in that cargo hold, when it was in all those metal boxes, when it was in the warehouse, uh, all of those things, everything was cold. And beer does not oxidize near as quickly uh, when it's cold or at least chilled. But at 120 degrees sitting in a metal box in the heat of the summer, whew, that's abuse, man. That's abuse. So <laughs> all of that beer we get in the fall that's been shipped over the summer, it's pretty messed up usually. But I get it the freshest I can. And uh, uh, my favorite is probably Eyinger. Uh, they just make a really flavorful uh, amber type of, of Merzen. And of the uh, Fest beer variety, it is hard to go wrong with the Vine Stefaner. That's a, a really, really good one. All right, guys. All right. Any other questions? If not, I'm going to turn off the uh, the audio. Thank you guys so much. We'll get this stopped.